does not involve us in this mission because he needs us. God involves us in this mission because he loves us. And he has reached down into our hearts and he has saved us that we might make this gospel known to the ends of the earth. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. I am humbled and honored to be here, to be back here on so many levels. I am so thankful to God for Mac Brunson, for his ministry to me and his ministry to pastors. First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, you know that you are a blessed people with this brother as your shepherd. And I'm thankful for this church and for your willingness to serve pastors like you have this weekend and for so many years. So thank you for the privilege of, of being a part of this. First Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to take a moment to find it and then, then look up here. I am keenly aware that I stand tonight in front of a group of people with very diverse needs. Some of you need joy. The busyness of this life, the burdens of this life are wearing you down and you are longing for a deep, abiding joy that supersedes the circumstances around you. Some of you need peace, maybe in the middle of making decisions, maybe in the middle of some confusion, not sure which way to go from here in your life, your marriage, your family, your work, and torn inside, not knowing what to do. Some of you need comfort. Some of you need comfort in the middle of conflict. Some of you need comfort in the middle of cancer. Some of you need comfort in the middle of grief. Some of you need love in a room with thousands of people. You find yourself at a point in your life where you feel alone and you are not sure where to turn. And some of you need strength. Some of you are just plain at the end of yourselves. Maybe as a pastor, maybe as a pastor's wife, maybe as a mom or a dad, a single mom or a single dad, a widow or a widower, a husband, wife, or single, you're just looking for the strength to go on. My aim tonight is to show you that your only hope for joy and your only hope for peace and your only hope for comfort and your only hope for love and your only hope for strength in life is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. Your only hope in life is found in the brutal, bloody, humiliating, horrifying death of a naked man on a wooden post. That is your only hope. That sounds strange to the world, but it is true. And tonight I want to show you why it's true. And my, my prayer is that every person in this room would walk away from the next few moments clinging tightly to the cross of Jesus Christ as the only hope in your life. 
I want to speak specifically to the Christian in this room because that's where this text speaks to. You look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Paul says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord our, and ours. The deal is, though, this is a group of Christians that Paul is writing to who had lost sight of the wonder and the centrality of the cross. They claimed that they were saved at the cross, by the cross, but then they had this dangerous tendency to move on in the Christian life to other things. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You don't move on from the cross. The Christian never moves on from the cross. The Christian lives at the cross. And so I want to show you, Christian, four reasons why the cross is the center of your life, your only hope in life. Now, I realize tonight that there are people in this room who are not Christians. And my prayer for you is that as I speak to Christians, that you would sense the Spirit of God opening your eyes for the very first time to the beauty and the wonder and the love and the peace that are found in the cross of Jesus Christ. And tonight, that your life might be changed for the next 10 billion years and so on. So, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the Lord let's pray father we pray that you would open by your spirit our eyes to the wonder and the weight and the glory of the cross so I'm in this room for the first time tonight and for all in this room who are your children to be reminded of the centrality of the cross in our lives and our churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, there is a lot here from the mouth of God, and I have struggled with how to best approach this text. So here's what I want to do in this passage. I want to walk through it chronologically, meaning... I want to start with looking at the cross from eternity past, and I want to work our way toward the cross in eternity future. So that's how we're going to kind of come at this text chronologically. And in the process, I want to show you four reasons why the cross of Christ is at the center of your life. Number one, because the cross represents God's 
predetermined affection for you. This is why the cross is the center of your life, because the cross represents God's predetermined affection for you. So we're going to start here with the most mind-baffling, confusing-causing, debate-inducing reason. Because the cross represents God's predetermined affection for you. I want you to circle a few words with me in this text, starting in verse 22. I'll tell you when to circle. Verse 22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are, here it is, called, circle called. Those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So you got that word called circled there. Then you get down to verse 26, for consider your calling. So circle it there, your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God, and here's a little different word, similar picture, chose. So circle chose. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose, circle it there, what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Verse 28, God chose, circle it there, what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So here, here's this picture of calling and choosing to describe how God drew Corinthian Christians to himself. And that's how this word calling is often used in the New Testament, particularly in the letters of Paul. So I was given this topic, the pastor and his calling. And when we think of calling, at least when I think of calling, my mind immediately goes to kind of a subjective individual, almost mystical sense that God has appointed me or God has appointed someone into ministry. God has appointed a man to pastor. But it's interesting, when you get into the New Testament, you don't see calling referred to that way. Instead, the way you see calling described, it's a picture of God drawing his people to himself, calling his people to salvation. So in a place like Romans 8 that you're familiar with, we know that all things work together for good to those who love him and are what? Called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is a picture of calling to himself. Same picture we see in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. This picture of calling. Now I want you to see why this is so important in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because it's, it's breathtaking when you think about it. Look at the contrast here. Go back up to verse 18 where we started. Paul says, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So follow with me here. There are two types of people, each with a different reaction to the cross. On one hand, you have those who are perishing, and to them, the cross seems absurd. The idea, start back, the idea that God would become a man. Right there, you've lost billions of people in the world. Muslims say, that's absurd. God would not debase himself by becoming a man. Hundreds of millions of others who think it would be preposterous for a man to claim to be God. Then take it further. Not just that God would become a man, but at, that as a man, he would be crucified. So feel the horror here. We wear crosses around our necks as jewelry, and we put them up on the walls in our homes. But you did not do that in the first century. It'd be like wearing an electric chair around your neck. It's weird, if not creepy. <laughs> Coming over to someone's home, looking up on their wall next to the kitchen table and seeing a picture of a lethal injection table. You don't stay for dinner. <laughs> but this is even worse, because cross crucifixion was the most brutal, torturous, shameful, gruesome way to kill someone, reserved for barbarians and slaves. And so that's why Paul says in verse 23, Christ crucified is a stumbling block to Jews. To a Jewish person, Christ crucified is shocking blasphemy. It's like saying, 
godly child abuser. That the Messiah, the Christ, would be hung on a tree. To be hung on a tree, Deuteronomy, is is an expression of the curse of God. The Messiah King would not be cursed of God in Jewish thought. Stumbling block and then folly to Gentiles. The word folly here literally means madness. Gentiles here about a Jewish man who died on a piece of wood and a non, on a nondescript hill in a nondescript part of the world and his death is supposed to determine the eternal fate of every person in the world. That is crazy. You step out of the story here. Imagine, imagine hearing today someone say there was a man who was executed by political authorities in a small Middle Eastern country. He was claiming to be the savior of the world. You would not give that story a second thought. It was a stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles. And let's admit it, this is absurd to Americans. Take the successful American businessman with a nice job and a big house and a cool car. And take the free-thinking American woman who thrives on her independence from everything, including God. Take them both outside to a city dump where in a back alley, a naked man is hanging by nails on a tree covered in blood. And you tell that man and that woman, your only hope in life is believing that this man is God and your eternity is dependent on submitting to him as your judge, your master, and your Lord. That man and that woman will laugh roll their eyes, at most feel sorry for this man in his deranged condition and walk away. This is an absurd message to Jews and Gentiles alike. But Paul is writing to a group of Jews and Gentiles who believed in Christ. And to them, the cross looked different, right? So you got one group of people, the cross seems absurd to those who are perishing. To us who are being saved, the cross is not absurd. The cross evokes awe and wonder to those who are being saved. There's a whole group of people here of whom Paul is one who sees the cross not as preposterous but powerful. Not as absurd but amazing. So here's the question I'm thinking when I come to this text. Why does one group of people see the cross as absurd and the other group of people see the cross as amazing? What's the difference between these two groups of people? What causes some people to say, That's preposterous. And other people just say, I submit and bow the knee to this Savior. And listen to Paul's answer. Paul says, the difference between these two groups of people has nothing to do with any specific quality in those who are called. Paul says, you are Christians. Verse 26, followers of Christ, saved, listen to this, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Translation, you were not voted most likely to succeed. You were voted most likely not to succeed. Then you go to verse 27. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. You, Paul says, are like something that is not. That's Not a compliment, just in case you were wondering. What sets you apart, Paul says, has nothing to do with how smart you are, where you were born, or what you have achieved. You are in the church not because of any merit in you, but only because of mercy in God. Follow with me. This is huge. Christian. Why do so many people in the world look at the cross and see folly while you and I look at the cross and see forgiveness. What's the difference? Are you and I smarter? Are we better? Are we in some way superior? Absolutely not. You see power in the cross of Christ only because of the mercy of God who has called your name. Turn turn over to Ephesians 1 with me, okay? This is mind-boggling when you think about it, right? And I'm not presuming tonight to know the mystery of how all this works. Because what we're looking at here is the the sovereign mercy of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. How 
by his grace, he opens our eyes to the power of the cross and he calls us. At the same time in scripture, we obviously also see the responsibility of man alongside the sovereign mercy of God. So, and we even back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul wrote, it pleased God through the folly of the cross to save those who believe, those who believe. So there's human action here that's involved in salvation, in becoming a follower of Jesus. There's belief, there's faith, there's something we do. And we are responsible for whether or not we believe. We are not puppets here on earth, products of some divine fatalism. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign and we are responsible. Both and. Okay, so J.D. Greer, who preached last night, he and I were headed to Indonesia on separate flights. We were going to preach over there together. His flight made it on time. Mine did not. It's flying out of Birmingham on Delta and was delayed first for 24 hours. And then another delay. It took me 70 hours to get to Indonesia. And so J.D. got to preach some of the sermons that I was planning on preaching and, and I'm sitting there in route for 70 hours. Now, in this situation, is God sovereign? Absolutely God is sovereign. He knew what was going on in Indonesia. He knew that JD's a better preacher than I am. He knew that he needed to be preaching those sermons instead of me. God was working in all of that, doing a work in my life, doing all kinds, infinite number of things he's doing. God is sovereign over that whole picture. But ladies and gentlemen, Delta was responsible. absolutely responsible. <laughs> so there's both here, both. What we're looking at, though, is sovereign mercy. So look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Catch this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been, here it is again, predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Ha! People look at this passage and say, I don't know about all this predestination stuff and choosing Well, what are you going to do? Take Ephesians 1 out of the Bible? Why in the world would you want to take that out of the Bible? That's good stuff. I am not trying, follow me here, I'm not trying to promote any kind of personal agenda here. I'm trying to trumpet a biblical agenda that says, and feel the weight of this, feel the weight of this, pastor, amidst your weakness, Amidst your struggles right now, amidst amidst those days when everything in you desires to quit, and man or woman, amidst the conflict in your home, the difficulties in your life, amidst your pain, and amidst your suffering, know this before the sun was ever even formed, before a star was even placed in the sky, before mountains 
were laid upon the earth before oceans were poured out upon the land. Before any of that, God Almighty on high set his sights on your soul. And he called your name. Not because of any merit in us, but totally because of mercy in him. So no matter what you're going through, know this, you have no reason to fear because the God who set his sights on your soul before time even began, he will most definitely keep you secure to the end. The cross reminds us of God's predetermined affection for us. It just blows you away, doesn't it? When you think about it, all right, I got to get going. Got three more points. All right. <laughs> cross represents God's predetermined affection for you. Second reason why the cross, your hope, is at the center of your life because the cross demonstrates God's past substitution for you. So it represents God's predetermined affection for you. Second, it demonstrates God's past substitution for you. So you come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and go to verse 30. Paul says, because of him, meaning because of God, God did this in your life. God did this. If I ask someone, how do you know you're saved? And the answer, the first words out of their mouth are, because I, they've missed the point. How do you know you're saved? Because God. Because God reached down his hand of mercy into my life. So God did this. Because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now that is only possible by the cross. The essence of sin is all over this passage. We have a sick tendency to assert our superiority before God. Our power, our wisdom. We rebel against his power and his wisdom. And as a result, we warrant his wrath. Every single one of us in our sin stands under the curse of God, destined for eternal destruction. But God, being rich in his mercy, sent his son to bear his wrath in our place as our substitute. On the cross, Jesus took all the wrath do you and all the wrath do me, Christian, and he endured it. Christ became a curse for us. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It was the Lord's will to crush his son instead of you. At the cross, Jesus was our substitute. He was standing where we deserve to stand. And in return by faith in him, what do we receive? Think about this exchange. At the cross, we give him our wickedness. 
He gives us, verse 30, his righteousness. At the cross, we give him our sin. He gives us his sanctification. At the cross, we give him our rebellion. And at the cross, he gives us his redemption. This is the great exchange made possible by the substitution of the Son of God in our place. Which is incredibly hope-giving, life-giving, strength-giving when you think about it. So when I was preparing to marry my wife, she's a year older than me, so married an older woman, so um, she's a year older than me, and she finished college before I did. And so we were going to wait until I graduated. And so that last year that we were engaged, before we got married, I was still in college, which meant I was living on college budget, eating ramen noodles every night, no job, no cash flow, just trying to make it through eating ramen noodles. She had graduated and had gotten a job. What that meant for her was cash flow, income, no ramen noodles. That was the way things were working for her. And so that was kind of the tracks we were on in that year while we were waiting to get married. Then it came to the day where we stood together in the front of the church and we committed our lives to each other. And on that day, I received so many wonderful things, most importantly being a beautiful, godly wife. But do you know what else I received on that day? Cash flow. <laughs> It was awesome. <laughs> like we stood, all I had to do was say, I do. <laughs> that was it. And at that moment, everything that was hers became mine. <laughs> now she was, she was a teacher, teaching these little snotty-nosed kids. I didn't have to go spend time in that classroom doing all this working for this, simply by the fact that my life was united with hers, everything in her bank account became everything in my bank account. <laughs> oh, brother or sister, in a much, much, much greater way, when you unite your life with Jesus the Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, at that moment, not based on anything you have done, can do, or will ever do, at that moment, everything that belongs to him becomes yours. Righteousness, holiness, and redemption, and sanctification. Church, we are not weak in this world. We are not weak in this culture. We have the power and the authority of Jesus the Christ himself. So stand with that authority when you preach, Pastor. Live with that confidence, Christian. It's all about at the cross. The cross demonstrates God's past substitution for you that makes this great exchange possible. Third reason. The cross represents, we're moving through time here, predetermined affection for you past substitution for you 2,000 years ago? Now, third reason. Because the cross makes clear God's daily execution of you. The cross makes clear God's daily execution of you. And I know that's strong language, but I mean it to be strong because this is what the Bible teaches. The cross is not just a place of death for Christ cross is a place of death for the Christian. Think immediately to, back to Jesus' words, all throughout the Gospels. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross. You take up an instrument of torture, bloody, humiliating shame, and follow me. <laughs> In a world where everything revolves around self, promote yourself, Exalt yourself, preserve yourself, take care of yourself. Jesus says, slay yourself. Amen. Die to yourself. Die to your power. Die to your wisdom. Die to your ways. Lose your life. 
This is what it means to be in Christ Jesus. It's to be crucified with Christ, to use Paul's language in Galatians 2.20. And we need to be reminded of this daily, especially in a world, and more specifically a church culture, where we have created this idea that all it It's involved in becoming a Christian is asking Jesus into your heart, inviting Jesus into your life, praying this prayer, signing this card, or raising that hand. None of those phrases mentioned in the Bible. And there are scores of people whose lives look no different than the rest of the world, but they prayed a prayer years ago, and so they assume that they are saved when they are not. Come to Christ, you lose your life as you once knew it. When you meet Christ at the cross, everything in your life changes. Imagine I came in here late tonight. Imagine those two incredible songs finish up, video plays, and then lights come up and nobody's standing here. Everybody's kind of looking around. Five, ten minutes, just kind of sit there awkwardly. And then, Five or ten minutes late, I come running in. I'm breathing hard, and I say, I am so sorry I'm late. I was on the way over here tonight and was on Interstate 95. It's 95 out there, right? Yeah, Interstate 95. And, and I had a flat tire, and so I pulled over. I was fixing the flat tire, and I accidentally stepped out into the middle of the interstate, and a Mack truck hit me. Just hit me head on. And it hurt. (laughs) And so I I got back up, put the the tire on the car, got in the car and rushed here, so I'm sorry I'm late. You would say to me that you are either lying or deceived. And the reason you would know that is because you know that when somebody gets hit by a Mack truck, they look different than they did before. (laughs) How much more when a person comes face to face with God in the flesh, the king of the nations, the savior of the world, who has all authority over disease and sin, sickness and death itself, the one who gave his life on a cross for the rescue of your soul. How is it possible to come face to face with him when you see him, everything changes? It is not possible to look the same after encountering the cross of Christ. You die to life as you know it, and you find new life in him. And that affects what you do every single day. The cross reminds you today, Christian, that you are dead to yourself. You no longer, we in this room, we no longer live for the passions and pursuits and pleasures and possessions of this world. We're dead to this world. And our lives look very different in this world as a result. We are living for treasure in the world to come. So I would ask some in this room who profess to be Christians, have you really met Christ? Have you really come to the cross? Let us be finished and done with lukewarm, half-hearted, world-loving versions of Christianity. And pastors in this room, let's preach the cross like this. Let's resist the temptation to promote some crowd-pleasing Christianity that attempts to make people feel good about idolatrous devotion to money, big houses, nice cars, possessions, sex, sports, and success. Let's call people to die and in dying to live. Reasons why the cross is at the center of our lives. Number one, because the cross represents God's predetermined affection for you. Two, because the cross demonstrates God's past substitution for you. Three, because the cross makes clear God's daily execution of you. Fourth and final reason, because the cross ensures God's ultimate glorification of himself. All these other things for you, for you. the cross ensures God's ultimate glorification of himself. 
Paul says it twice at the end of this passage, verse 29, verse 30. So starting verse 28, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things are not, that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that. Why, Paul? Why did God chose to show mercy like this? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He continues. And because of him, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, here it is again, ultimate purpose clause, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Why has God designed salvation to depend solely on his grace? So that sinners have only one place to turn when it comes to giving glory. Not by works, so that no man can boast, only because of God. So Christian, do not boast ever in your money, particularly in your heart. And do not boast in your achievements and your successes. Do not boast in what you have been able to do or are able to do with your hands, all of these things will burn up in the end. For eternity, a Christian will boast in one thing. In the words of Paul in Galatians 6, we will boast only in the cross of Jesus Christ. So let us boast in the God who before the foundation of the world set his sights on your soul. He called us, not because of our merit, but solely because of his mercy. Let us boast in the God who sent his son to be our substitute, who even at this moment clothes us in his righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Let's boast in the God who crucifies us daily to experience the life that only he can give. And let's boast in the God who alone deserves all honor, all glory, and all praise among all the nations of the earth. And let's say with the songwriter, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose? So rich a crown. His dying crimson, like a robe, spreads o'er his body on the tree. Then I am dead to all the world, and all the world is dead to me. So were the whole realm of nature mine, that would be a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine demands my soul, my life, and my all.